It's Friday. Woo. Um, homework's due tonight, right? So we got uh, do do. Where is it at? Class sessions. Oh, of course I'm not logged into Blackboard. Why would I be logged into Blackboard? That is such a silly idea. Uh, not my Oakland login. Requirements engineering. Homework's due tonight, right? So make sure that you get that in and that you just check to make sure that you've got everything necessary and more than likely I will be happy with it. All right, so we've got a lot to do today. Somebody please stop me at about 8.35 if I am yelping on for too long here. I'm going to do a little... A little demo type of thing. So, let's see, where were we at? I get a demo at all my term project too for you all. Oh, that was the other, well, yeah, not the other thing. Um, since I don't have your midterm requirements up there yet, because I want to pretty them up a bit. Don't worry, just talking to myself. Happens when you get older. All right, so we ended up here last time, I believe. We are talking about cost estimation techniques, right? So we went over schedule, get a little dot out of the way. We had um, our expert panel. We had looking at other projects that are out there. We have the technique where we explain how much time we have, and then we backfill our time with that basically effort estimation. We can go by customer price, we can go by schedule. All right, so these were the techniques we talked about so far in our overview of cost estimation. And again, if you zoned out last time, keep in mind that these are all basically trying to figure out what you need for your project. And you're kind of going to be doing this for your next homework, and it's going to lead into your midterm stuff where I'm going to ask you to basically estimate tasks. You're not going to have to do a cost estimation model. It's, it's more figuring out what has to be done kind of a thing. So what we're going to talk about today is algorithmic, algorithmic cost estimation. And this is where there is going to be about what feels like a hundred acronyms and I can guarantee I'm going to forget what all of them mean. So I will be flipping back and forth between slides because these are basically all just variables that go into a model, but you get a little bit more of a ideally a, a good estimate with this. Uh, and what is a model? Well, a model is basically something that you can use to predict something else. Is the model always correct? No, but usually you have a pretty good indication of things using a model. And a model tends to be, you know, something that is mathematically defined either based on past history, whether there's some kind of a rigorous formal proof behind it, but usually there's a good predictor. You may have heard of models in terms of things like machine learning or artificial intelligence where the program at hand detects what's going on it goes into some ai model or like a it's probably like a neural network or something under the hood right where it parses out all these inputs and it spits out an answer and that answer is move forward if you're a car or turn right or turn left or if it's a robot stop or shake hands or you know whatever the robot's doing a model is kind of a generic thing. It's it's a basically a mathematical construct in a way. Project-wise, what do we care about? We care about several factors. It's going to be effort. It's going to be people, kind of soft metrics and hard metrics. So we're going to basically be talking about how a model can actually use project-based estimation. And one of the most well-known algorithm most well-known algorithmic models out there is called Kokomo. Now this is the constructive cost model. There is a version one and a version two. We're going to talk about version one. It is most adequate for techniques like waterfall, 
again, one of those ones where we know everything early on. However, the newer version is more suited for the more agile variants. We're not going to really go over that one, but just be aware it's an extension of this model. Similar concepts, you plug in different numbers, but you still basically get the gist with Kokomo 1. Now, this is an empirical model. Empirical because it was from a large number of completed software projects, and they used this data to inform the model. Does anybody know what the term empirical means, out of curiosity? So this is a very academic term. I'll give you a hint if you don't know. Logic-based, kind of. So empirical tends to be used when you have some kind of an experiment, a measuring system that <laughs> Very nice. I like that. Empirical. That's imperial, not empirical. <laughs> Very close. So empirical is basically when you have evidence. Um, and a good example would be why you pick particular magic numbers for your programs or your algorithms. You know, your professor looks at your program and you say, well, why is x equals 20 here? Like, well, it worked for my program, right? That's an empirically designed decision. You're using past evidence to figure out what this value is. That's basically all it is. You've run some experiments. You know these numbers work. They are empirically defined. So you have past evidence to show that. Um, so collecting data from a large number of projects, basically scanning a whole laundry list of open source projects that are out there, they derive this particular model, which means they figured out the equations, they figured out the, um, the scalars, the multipliers, the exponential values. It's going to look like a whole bunch of magic numbers to you. Uh, and if you are not understanding what a magic number is, it's a bad thing to do in your program. It's where you just have numbers that don't mean anything to anybody other than you. So empirically defined is a better way to talk about it. Yeah, so I said there's two of these models. So the first one was actually made in 81. So it's from way back when in terms of ancient computing history. Again, fits nicely with Waterfall. The newer one was published in 2000. I'm sure there have been refinements made since then. I actually haven't checked personally. But they're trying to figure out how we can take this estimation model and apply it to all the new paradigms, right? Your agiles, prototyping, um, they have a completely different process. What does that mean for our cost estimation models? Well, they have to be updated as well, because you can't rely on rigorously defined requirements anymore, right? You can't rely on all of that hard structure that's in place with Waterfall. Your models are going to change as well with this. So... What do we care about for Kokomo here? Generally, we're going to have six different ways to look at something minimally here. Um, there's going to be the easy, the intermediate, and the more difficult one. The easiest one is just looking at how big the code base is going to be. Now, nowadays, code base lines of code means pretty much nothing, right? You can have million lines. You can have a program that's a million lines of code, and it's just a Node.js application, right? Because it's all the packages that are coming in for that. But if you think of lines of code in terms of human effort, where I have to write you know, 500,000 lines of code to get this particular behavior to work, you can kind of estimate how much effort that will take a person based on that. Keep in mind, lines of code do not involve comments. This is actual functional code. So we care about the size of the code base. We care about the function points. So this could be if you have an external input or output, right? You have a function being called. It's interacting with something, whether it's an API or a user. Maybe there's an interface to something else. Could be pulling in a file from the system or from a remote source. So basically, how do we invoke things basically another aspect is going to be your object points your application points so basically how many user interfaces do you have to design 
right? Those of you that are doing graphical applications, you have, you're trying to think of it in terms of something like scenes, right? So you have the menu scene, you have the gameplay scene, maybe it's like a level one, level two, level three scene, or you have the town and the caverns or something like that, right? Or if you're doing a phone app, you have the login screen, you have the interface screen, you have the option screen. So how many screens do you have to create? There's effort for each one of those, and they're not all just copy and paste, right? You might have to produce reports. So user clicks a button that spits out a PDF. It's not magic. You have to aggregate a whole bunch of data, format it properly, and dump it to that report. So again, this all takes effort. And as the project manager, you have to realize how much effort one thing over the other is going to take in this you know, before we kind of hand waved it, right? An expert would say it's going to take me 10 months to build this GUI application. Here we're actually getting into some hard metrics. Um, it's going to be hidden here now that I'm trying to highlight it, but how many components you have to design and bring in. So if you want to look at it from a black box perspective, and this is kind of your block diagram view of a system where you have things coming in, things going out, and you have a black box of magic happening. That's basically what Kokomo is doing here. So what we care about simplistically is how many lines of code, what mode are we going to be running this model in, which we're going to talk about in the next slides, and then the cost driver ratings, which we're also going to be talking about soon. Kilo lines of code is basically all of these points here kind of lumped together. And what do we get out of this model? We get how much effort it will take in an approximate schedule. And it being a algorithmic model, we should have a fairly decent schedule out of this. And I'm going to be popping up a website to kind of flip back and forth to show you some of these tables of what these magic numbers are. There's actually, I think it's a C++ program specifically for this model where you could actually run your model if you plug in all these values. So we have three modes or levels, and I'm going to call these levels because the next slide also calls them modes, and but they're different. So we have the basic level where we're going to look at effort and strictly in terms of the size of the program. So how many lines of code are there? That is going to be our input, and that's it. This is good to do early on in the project because we don't have a lot of the other pieces in place yet. All right, so if I'm estimating this program is going to take 2 million lines of code, then that's my input to the model. How much effort will this take us? You don't get a lot of the nuance with that, right? Um, you're missing a lot of information. And what happens with models that don't have proper information going in? You get a very flaky estimate. But it might be enough of an estimate to get you started. So it can be good, it can be misleading. Just something to keep in mind when we're doing cost estimation. Next level is intermediate, so we're going to take the effort as program size plus cost drivers. Cost drivers are, again, these are going to become magic numbers, but basically it's your, not soft metrics, but basically you're including people, you're including devices, um, subjective assessments of project attributes. So basically, we're giving this model more information. What happens when you feed a model more information? You get a more precise answer. Again, this all depends on how good the model is. If you have a crap model, you're going to get crap output. This model is fairly reasonable at guesstimating your project efforts. So basically, what we have is very early on, let's just guess how many lines of code plus some other factors, and we'll get an estimate. Let's say we have our requirements specified. We have a better feel for how many people we're going to need. We know what hardware and software we're going to have plus lines of code. We get a little bit better of an estimate. And then after you go through the design phase, right? we're doing our models, we're doing our requirements refinement. Then we have extra information as well. So we have our subjective assessments here. And then we have basically more cost drivers, which we can apply. Again, we have more information, get a better answer. But getting all of this information into the model is tricky sometimes. <clears throat> I 
All right, so those are kind of the the levels. So you have beginner, intermediate, advanced is basically what this is. You also have project modes or development modes. I like to think of these as modes and the other ones as levels, just so you don't use the same term. But basically here you have organic, semi-detached, and embedded. So organic is a simple, small project, right? You have not super rigid requirements. It's a small thing. You can get a good estimate with an organic model. We have then something a little more intermediate in size, intermediate in complexity. So basically, you're just going up in the scale of complexity for a project. Your team may have mixed experience levels, so you're not all just you know your friends who all are about the same level of coding. It's going to be working on a bigger project team. You have some new people fresh out of college. You have some experienced people. You have some interns. You have people that don't know how to program because they're in marketing or something like that, right? So you have more to deal with. So we have that. Or you have an embedded project where you have very rigorous constraints defined. Um, operational hardware, software, safety, basically with like an embedded system, could almost consider it a safety critical system. Everything has to be specified properly for it to function and meet specifications, meet safety constraints and things like that. You can kind of see the difference here in the information you'd put in, hopefully. Right before it was kind of metrics. Here it's a little more subjective in terms of the types of project and the people working on it. Right, organic, you could almost think of like your term project teams. We just kind of slapped you all together, you know, based on who you know, or you know, maybe if you your team had space, right? It came together organically. Your requirements are very non-rigid for this project, right? So you're basically an organic model. If I had taken everybody in class and said, okay, you're the project manager, you're gonna run three sub teams of this group, this group, and this group. Each group has to have a local project manager with a quality person and a and 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 right. That'd be more semi-detached. And embedded would be something even more rigorous. So enough of uh, me yammering on about the things going into it. What does the model look like? So we're going to take three magic numbers here, so C, K, and M, and we're going to multiply them all together with the size. So this is where, so I've got this link here. It has some very nice tables, and it's actually a pretty good explanation if what I'm talking about doesn't make sense. C and K are established empirically and given by the model. So basically C and M and even K, we're going to have lookup tables for. M, so this guy right here, this is going to be your quality, um, what we call it before? Uh, cost drivers, sorry. Not quality drivers, cost drivers. So the product, the computers, the personnel, this is going to be your M. Your C is going to be, um, basically it's just going to be a scalar. And then we have an exponential tacked onto the size. So I've got, um, and again, I've got this page here that I'm going to flip back and forth between. Basically, it's a good overview of the Kokomo model, and it kind of goes through all of these bullet points. Let me maybe make this a little bit bigger. But here we see um, what some of these magic numbers are, right? So if you're an organic model, your C is going to be 2.5, for instance. And here's the C++ program they had as well. And then they had other attributes as well. And these, these are the cost drivers that I've been kind of mentioning. So how important are they to your project? Here is the number that you would fill into the model, if this makes sense. Hopefully HiDad doesn't do anything bad there. So here's all the things you as the project manager has to consider, right? What's your requirement development schedule? What is the level of experience your team has with the language? How good are your analysts, right? What do you have a virtual machine and what's your experience with that? What's the turnaround time? So these all have a magic number associated with them. And if you don't like the term magic number, you're going to hear it a lot. So just you know, do this for today. These are all empirically defined numbers, right? And they have been refined over time, basically. So. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to try to flip back and forth between that page to kind of give you an idea of what these things are. <clears throat> and what do we get out of this? How many person months will the project take? 
one person month is the amount of work slash effort by one person in one month. Right, so a person month is a term, or you also have person years. Magic numbers are much better than imaginary numbers, absolutely. All right, so full screen, please, pointer, thank you. So here's our various models that we have. And again, these are where those magic numbers come into play. So here are your C values, here are your K values. And if you go intermediate or beyond, you get an M value, right? Where M is gonna be those cost drivers. So based on which project you think you have, based on how many killer lines of code you have, you can put in these numbers and then you get an estimated number of person months out of it. Idea makes sense more or less. Basically, you're trying to figure out how many people you need at the end of the day, right? How much effort this project will take. And that's your job as a project manager to hire people to get things done. So if you go beyond the basic, you get to intermediate and advanced. There are 15 cost drivers for M calculation. So that was that longer table that I kind of flipped through a few moments ago, where based on what you're rating this particular driver, you're going to get a value out of it. And we care about the product, the computers, the personnel, and the project. All right, so let me, let me go back here really quickly. Again, cost drivers, these are those ratings that you would give. Here are the attributes you care about, right? Project personnel, hardware, um, project. It's a fill in the blank kind of a thing. Pick the number that works for you. Well, that works for you, that applies to your project is what I actually meant to say. And then basically figure it out here. So, and this is where we start getting into acronyms. Um, and this is just to ideally make things easier, but I can guarantee I'm going to forget what each one of these are as I talk through it, just because I don't do Kokomo modeling on a daily basis. But we have basically these high-level categories, right? So reliability, complexity, software tool, schedule. These factor into that formula. So hopefully this, this idea makes sense that we're just plugging numbers into a model here. So we had product cost, we have project cost, we have computer cost and personnel cost. So what is your experience level on your team? How good are your people? How much time does that person need to be brought up to speed? Right, usually it's easier to have somebody already there and retrain them than it is to hire somebody new and bring them fully on board. So these are things that you have to consider. All right, so let's look at a slightly different view here. Um, we have our organic, semi-detached, and embedded views where we're looking at the development time. This is slightly different than person months. All right, so again, these are the values given by the model. We have another K value here. Effort's gonna come out of our basic, intermediate, advanced. So this is the person months. This is the development time. And again, these are values given by our model so far. Probably very confusing as I'm explaining this, but it really is a plug and play kind of a model, which makes life a lot easier for the analyst. And here's basically just a snapshot of this, this particular figure. Right, so here we see 2.5. There's our 2.5. So we have a C-level software project. Or sorry, no, not the C level. That's the value for C. Our D is varying. So 0 0.38, 0.35, 0.32, 0.38, 0.35, 0.32. Numbers just go into this thing. So then let's do an example where we try to actually figure this out, you know, rather than me saying this does this, does this, does this. If we have um, a basic model for Kokomo 1, so we want to figure out the, the person, month, effort, and the time duration for a system. So this is an embedded system, meaning that we have very rigorous constraints. For the system, we're assuming that we have about 10,000 lines of code. Um, so how does this work with the model? Well, we know it is a basic embedded system. So the values that we plug in for C and K 
respectively are 3.6 and 1.20, right? So we just figure out what we need based on our lookup table. And here's our kilo lines of code, right? So we have 10,000 source instructions. That's 10 kilo lines of code. The estimated effort for a basic model is 58 person months. Plug that into our secondary formula. This is going to be nine months of effort overall. Make sense so far? So basically we have two equations where the output of this one goes into here. Now, assuming that you buy this as a model, and right, that was the easy model, the basic one where you just look at lines of code, how likely do you think it is that this will actually estimate the correct effort and a correct schedule? And again, there are two different things, how many person months versus how many development time development months. I don't have a slide for this, so just drop it in the chat. I know this is all horribly exciting, but you may have to do this at some point. So just keep in mind, you're going to have models to help you out here. <clears throat> Any guesses at all? So again, let's think about this in terms of what we're putting into the model, All right? So we're looking at this embedded system here. I'm clicking on a streaming software, so arrow keys don't work. I have an embedded system, right? 10,000 lines of code. If that is the only parameters I'm putting into this model, it's probably going to be not super accurate. We are not taking the time into sourcing the hardware that we need. We're not taking the time and effort into making sure our constraints are met. You don't know how many changes there will be, so good point there. We may have a good approximate measure, but again, it's not going to be perfect. We're going to have to add in more information to this model later on. But is this number valid and good? Sure. We can use it to estimate the rest of our project, and then we can refine it as we go. right? Kind of like our requirements or our use cases, we're going to refine them over time as we get more information. So we have some caveats for this. So the time required to complete a project is a function of the effort required for the project. All right, so. Keep in mind, I haven't said how many people we need, right? That model does not show you need 10 people to do something. I've got this in big, bold, hidden by the professor. Oh yeah, let's do that, sorry. Clicking the wrong thing there. Let me make me a little smaller. All right, <coughs> huge, bold font. You can't just throw people at a problem and expect it to get done quicker. Dividing the effort by the development schedule does not tell you how many people you need. So I can't just take 58 person months divided by 10, you know, whatever it was, like nine, I think it, uh, let me go back here. Yeah, nine months. So 58 person months divided by nine months, I think is like six and a half people. You can't just divide it out. And I'm curious, so why do I make this point? I think we've talked about this before, right? Where there's the, uh, trying to figure out if this is appropriate or not. You can't make a baby in one month if you have nine people working on it or something like that, is the, the engineering joke anyway. You can't just keep throwing people at a problem and expect it to get done quicker. I mean, that's that's the common engineering joke in industry, at least. So you heard it here first. Poor taste, possibly, but. 
think of if I have a 58 person month project and I estimate nine months of effort. It's not just going to be a function of the number of people because each person has to be onboarded. Each person has to have responsibilities and training and, and, and. And the more people you bring onto something, the more differing opinions there be, the more differences in experience levels there will be, right? So you probably have found that if, um, you know, you have a large term project team, sometimes it's harder to get work done than it is if you're just a team of two because you have to work with a larger group. Or there's going to be some hang-ups you know, personalized. Point is that don't be the project manager that thinks you can just throw people at a problem. It's never going to work. I can guarantee it right now. <laughs> I've seen it before. Uh, and if you don't believe me, there are lots of jokes in the, uh, the Dilbert comic strip that also poke fun at that. His interesting leanings that are coming out notwithstanding, I suppose. All right, so that was Kokomo. Like I said, we're not going to talk about Kokomo 2. It's an extension of Kokomo 1, so if you know and you kind of understand how the first one works, the second one is basically the similar idea. So we have another side of things here, and I realize I've got a couple more minutes before I wanted to go into my demo. So we also have earned value analysis. So this is basically where we are going to figure out a percent of completeness. We are not using soft metrics like um, a subjective viewpoint or a gut feeling that I've got here. Basically, we have a, a lot of hard numbers that we can plug into a project. And it's still a model. It's basically a different type of model here. Um, so we have to know resources. We have to know rates and costs. We have to know tasks. Basically, we have to know a lot more for this particular technique. And this set of slides, this is where the acronyms are really going to fly off the handle here. So we have to compute a number of things. We have to complete the budgeted cost of the work scheduled. So basically, for each task, how much cost will there be by a point in time? We have to be able to sum all this up for the completion. We have to complete a budget. We have to figure out the actual cost. And once we figure these values out, and if you have like a project management software where you enter resources and tasks and timing and duration and all of that kind of stuff, you can actually get these values out of those by, by and large. These will go into more acronyms. So let's say we have these values. This is where I said I'm not going to remember them all. We can start figuring out performance indicators. So let me, I've got a cheat sheet here with acronyms defined so that I don't look like a complete fool. But they're not on this slide, they're in the next one. Um, we can figure out the performance index. We can figure out the percent complete, the percent scheduled for completion. These are all basically either dividers or subtractors of those values we calculated on the last slide. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, well, not too far ahead, because this is kind of the important thing to get out of this earned value analysis technique. So let's say you have a schedule and you have a budget. We can figure out with a very simple, basically, are we ahead of schedule or are we behind schedule? Are we under budget or are we over budget? Based on these metrics that you've calculated. And I should say, are you ahead of schedule or behind schedule is not simply looking at your project management charts of tasks and saying, oh my, we're behind, you have a massive array of data that all gets plugged into this, and then you get one number out saying if you're ahead or behind, right? It's not just look at the timeline visually, it's plug all the numbers in and crunch them. So these values here that you're getting out, oh, I'm freezing a little bit, that you get out of these values, you can say if SPI is greater than one, you're ahead, if it's less, you're behind. If CPI is greater than one, you're under your budget. If it's less than one, you're over your budget. And what's CPI again? That's your cost performance index, which is right here, which is a function of your cost of work performed divided by your actual cost. So again, feel free to let your eyes gloss over from all the acronyms. 
but basically you're just getting, are you ahead or behind, right? So I'm actually going to stop here. We're actually pretty much at the end anyway. Um, but I've got a, an example which kind of walks you through and kind of doesn't. But you have X planned work tasks. You have Y planned work days. 12 tasks were completed. 15 should have been completed based on these numbers and how much effort each task took versus what we thought. We can calculate out these kind of starting values. You can plug these starting values into those ratios or those subtractors basically, right? So what's your SPI? What's your SV? You know, what are all these acronyms that I said were important, right? And again, based on all of this stuff, greater than one or less than one, right? So if you're greater than one, you're ahead of schedule. If you're less than one, you're behind schedule. And right here, you can see very clearly in an easy to digest format that we are behind schedule. Well, if you actually look at your problem statement, 12 tasks have been completed, 15 should have been completed. Yeah, clearly you're behind schedule, right? But it might not be that simple. So we have to get some metrics to figure things out. So we're behind in 30 person days, for instance. Not trying to like scare you off with formulas that are kind of difficult to parse out. Basically, if you go down the project manager route, you're probably going to have to do an earned value analysis at some point. <clears throat> but just be aware, it's, it's honestly not tricky math. It's just a lot of acronyms to fill in the blanks for. So what I wanted to get to now was the next homework that you are all going to have to do is a timing diagram. I'm going to give you a Gantt chart example. I know we talked about it, but I wanted to show you an actual tool you can use. The point of this assignment, and it's going to go up you know, after the current ones do. I don't want to give you two at the same time. Or maybe I should. I don't know if that's easier for you all mentally or not, just so that you know what's coming up. But basically, for your term project, I want you to figure out what you have completed so far. I want you to figure out what you have remaining to do. And then I want you to create a timing diagram. So again, deliverable is a minimum viable product. So a nice prototype, not a fully, pro fully polished thing. The goal here is to get a handle on what you have remaining. I'm going to show you a Gantt chart. I don't care if you do a Gantt or an Agile related one, like a burn down or a burn up. The thing, though, is that with this particular setup that we've been doing so far, it kind of lends itself better to a Gantt chart. And the reason why is that I'm thinking of this in terms of tasks. These are like blocks of things that have to be done. Whereas a burn down, burn up chart, you'd be using things like user stories. And those are going to be like small little snippets of a use case type of thing, right? I would like my login screen to be... Um, pretty or, or something like that, whatever your user story definition is. If your team is working in an agile format and maybe you're doing user stories in some way, shape or form where they're like smaller chunks of a task, by all means, try to do a burn down or a burn up chart. I've got some references in here. I updated the slides, by the way. I don't have project. I don't want to sign up for the full version of Lucid charts. Uh, I do like their snack vid, so that was quite cute. But I think you only get a seven-day trial of Lucid before you have to start paying for it. If I understood correctly, I might be wrong. But I looked up a bunch of different links out there. And there are a ton of resources for how to do Gantt charts, how to do burn down, burn up charts, um, in whatever your favorite tool is. So you can do it in Google Sheets. So I've got a How-To Geek link here. There's a template in draw.io. So I'll show you that in a second here. You can create burn down, burn up in Excel. If you'd like, you, there's also ones for Google Sheets out there as well. Um, like here is a, a Gantt chart in draw.io. Thing is, though, this is just boxes and text boxes, right? Like there's not a good connection here. So like I can move this arrow around and it means nothing. What's a snack? Look up the Lucid chart snack video. It was delightful. Nope, ropes, snacks, and danger noodles. Many names, like... We watched that last time, though. 
So basically, the, the point is I've got some references here for you. I also have a list of open source tools. So I installed one called Gent Project. There are some really cool web-based solutions out there. Um, there are some really cool open source projects. You don't need Microsoft Project is kind of the point, or you don't need Atlassian and Jira and all of that framework. You can do these charts very easily by yourself. Um, you can do it visually like this. There is this drawgant.com. I spelled cookies wrong here. Just notice that where basically you're going to add your tasks in. I'm going to use this local program here called Gantt chart. It looks kind of like this. Um, I will say Gantt charts tend to be problematic if you have a evolving project, just to let you know. Um, I tried tracking my graduate student tasks, like when I was a grad student, I had Gantt charted out my tasks and I got rid of that right quickly. So what I thought I would do is I'd show you what I've done so far for my project. Again, I'm working along with you because I think it's fun to learn something new. Well, you guys are all learning something new. So basically the homework is what have you done so far and what do you have left to do? So in terms of artifacts, I've written a base proposal and I've made some use cases. For my implementation, right, I made a Pygame interface. I figured out a tile map um, plug, or not a plugin, but basically a class so I can do nice sprite sheet type stuff. I have Perlin noise being generated for my overworld. I learned about an entity component system, and I've been playing around with tracery demo. So this took me probably two weeks to get done. It can be general at this point, right? You don't have to have perfect numbers. So to show you like what all this stuff is, I actually moved over to uh, VS Code the other day for fun. So I actually finally got stuff working. So this is all Perlin noise. I've got a camera system kind of working. Not perfect, but it kind of works. And I've got my little tile map. So tile map, I've got a sprite sheet, which is all these little glyphs are coming out of basically one image. I've got my duckies and my doggies and my player here. I don't have them uh, marching cubes. I'm... Uh, I'm thinking I'm going to have multiple random procedural generators here. This is just one of them. It's surprisingly easy to implement, though. So that's where I am at. When we get to the end of the month and we do our term project demos for class, that is kind of what I would show, right? Is it pretty? No. <laughs> Does it work? Eh, kind of. But this is where I'm at right now, and what I have left to do is almost more important. right? So I have this. What do I have left to do? Um, I will have to do my software requirements spec. You all should know by now that that's going to be one of your final deliverables. So that's going to say take me four weeks to nail down. And then whatever the professor doles out his homework along the way. Okay, so three weeks or something like that. All right, what else do I have to do? Well, if I want to hook in this nifty grammar-based generator, <coughs> well, I have to have it generate my world. I have to have it generate conversations. Let's say that's going to take me two weeks to do. My scrolling map is nice, but it has problems. I just haven't had time to look at it. My players and my entities don't interact. They just kind of walk around. Uh, the camera doesn't really work on them, so I have to fix that. Look at different procedural functions, add some towns, add some quests. So this all kind of, you start seeing where things have to go, right? So I'm going to move this over here so that I can look at it. But in this tool, Again, use whatever tool you like. This is one that I installed. I didn't have to sign up for anything. It's open source if you use the uh, non-paid version. So here we have an interface. So I need some resources, and resources are people, right? So let's say Eric Fredericks. Um, you can add like days off. You can add a whole bunch of information about your resource. So I am now in the system. There's me. Now I need some tasks, and I'm not going to go through and do everything here because it's going to start getting, you know, it's basically going to be the same over and over. Let's hook tracery into world generator. So I want a grammar-based implementation to generate my world. So it's, let's say I'm going to start tomorrow, and it's going to take me one week. So it's going to take me seven days. So here I have hook tracery in. 
cool. Again, Tracery is that uh, like a story generator that people have been using for really cool stuff. I need another task. So this task is going to be hook Tracery into NPC conversations. All right, so I have this here. And this is also going to take seven days. So let's say seven days. However, the one only can happen after the other. So here I have a dependency. Because first I need to figure out this framework, um, and then I have to implement it. So I can't do the NPC stuff before I figure out the world generation stuff. So we actually see this has to be done first, then this thing. All right, what else do I have to do? I need to work on my software requirements spec. So work on SRS. This is going to take me four weeks to do. So that's uh, 28 days. Let's move this down a bit. I should be able to move this. Oop. Don't want to do that. Can I not? Oh, I guess that's going to have to be how it is. So I want these separate. Oh, there we go. Of course, it's a thing. And I hit undo so I don't have my 28 days anymore. And you have to start on 23rd, let's say, random date. So you can kind of see tasks starting to overlap, right? You can see what week we're on. We can see maybe when the final deadline is. And hey, that actually aligned pretty nicely with uh, close to the end of the semester. <coughs> and again, you can kind of get a feel for what tasks are remaining, what has to be done first, who's going to be assigned to what. Right? If When you're all going to be doing this, I'll probably also ask who's going to be responsible for which task. Right? You don't all have to work on the same thing thing, but you all should be doing something implementation-wise, right? So assign one of your people to work on the interface, assign one person to work on the movement system, or two people to work on the movement system, if that makes sense. But here we start actually planning out what has to be done by when. And I'm not necessarily going to hold you to your deadlines. That's going to be internal to you, because you know what needs to be done. Um, I just care about the final deliverable, deliverable, me as the project manager, right? So what else can we get out of a tool like this? Well, we've added resources, we've added tasks. We can actually see um, a PERT chart. So remember we talked about PERT before? That was the critical path version. So here we have a lightweight PERT chart being generated. So here is my tasks. We get the start, the end, the duration. We see dependencies. So again, this was our critical path chart. And if I added a lot more information, I'd have a lot better of a feeling for what that critical path would be. I can also implement, oh, implement I can export it to PDF where or project or PNG or whatever you want. Well, let's say I do it to PDF and it's going to be, okay, document.pdf. This is something that you give to your project manager then, right? And say, here's our project. Where is my document? There we go. So here's my PDF export. Again, I'm, I'm missing a lot of information in here because I haven't filled in all the blanks. But here's my tasks. Here's a very crisp, clear table. Um, here are the resources for the project. And here's a little snippet of what it looks like. So again, this is not strictly the best way to manage a project timing, especially in the world of Agile, but it's definitely one way that you can do that. So that is the demo there. Um, and there's the snack video again. I will put the formal requirements up in Blackboard probably either tomorrow or Sunday after you you know, I don't want to distract anybody with the current homework. But basically, your next thing is going to be task identification and timing, and then push to the midterm presentation. Uh, one minute left. Any questions at all from you all today? And what we're going to get to next week is we'll be getting to more UML. So we'll talk about like use case diagramming, um, sequence diagrams, things like that. Is there a link for it? Yeah, so it is in the slide. So I updated the PDF. Um, basically, here are here's a list of 
open source or free projects out there that I found. Uh, it's called it's called uh, Gantt Project. Uh, let me pop the. I'll just pop the link in the chat. Gantproject.biz. So basically, you just use the free version. You don't need the uh, the paid version. Alrighty. So things to look forward to. Again, uh, task management, midterm, and then after that, you'll probably do some UML diag or not, yeah, some UML diagramming. We'll get into testing, and then we'll probably do basically a push for the final. After that is kind of what I'm thinking we'll be doing. So. Other than that, have a wonderful weekend. Um, we need some, let's see, slamming outro music. All right. Hmm. Nothing good. No, thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Have a good. Uh, have a great weekend.